Good evening and welcome to Space Oddities. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, you're more than welcome. And for our returning viewers, thank you for being here. You join us, of course, on a very sad day for the UK with the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. Um, and uh, it's been quite a day. So um, we wish, obviously, King Charles the very best of luck for the future as our new monarch. And, um, and there we are, a very sad day altogether. But never mind, the universe goes on. And I'm joined by an illustrious panel tonight. Hello, hello. panel. Hello, hello. Hello, Andy. Hello. hello. How are you all doing? Great. Well, how Very long good. you got? But, We've only got I, an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to point out it's not just the UK. The Commonwealth countries are also observing the Absolutely. passing of Queen. And uh, I know in Australia they're taking a day. A lot of the companies have closed down. Several of the provinces here in Canada, same thing. Yes, indeed, indeed. And it, it was actually lovely to see all the assembled heads of the, the Commonwealth assembling in, in Westminster Abbey. Every single Prime Minister of Canada from the past who's still alive was there at the funeral. Yes. It, was, it, was, it was quite a, you know, under very sad circumstances, it was so nice to see everybody uh, getting together in the spirit of the Commonwealth. And that, that was uh, truly a, a remarkable occasion. It's been very noticeable too. Then the interviews they do on, in the queue to uh, the the lying in state. How many people had come over from overseas, flown in specifically yes. to join join the queue? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. So we will move on on a packed show tonight. Um, 
uh, Kareem is going to tell us uh, about a little more about star mass and uh, show us the star mass uh, um, slides that he has. Apologies, Kareem, that we didn't have time to fit them in last week, but we did. No worries. Uh, we did. Uh, we did have a wonderful introduction to star mass uh, from you. Um, so we'll come to you uh, in a little while. Uh, we'll have Rogers, of course, uh, a regular spot um, on on his night sky. What's up in the night sky? Uh, we're going to talk a little about the uh, the passing of Frank Drake, and um, and the departure of a, a senior member of NASA, who Bernard is going to tell you about, and uh, and there we are. So I think we'll uh, we'll we'll crack straight on. And uh, Kareem, um, before you get into the slides, for the benefit of our viewers who weren't here last week, could you just uh, just give us a, a very brief introduction to Starmus and, and what it's all about? Sure thing. So Starmus is an international festival that started about eight years ago. It was the brainchild of uh, astrophysicist Derek Israelian, astrophysicist and musician Brian May, as well as Stephen Hawking. And the idea was to have uh, some sort of an event on an international scale with really an impressive list of luminaries that could present on topics within not just space, but also science communication overall. And then combine that with the love of music with live concerts from musicians of different genres. But the original one was actually a 108 minute panel discussion in honor of uh, Yuri Gagarin's first flight uh, in orbit around the earth. And so there's still a 108 minute panel as part of every single Starmus Festival since. Now the Starmus Festival has been held at the Canary Islands often. It was in Armenia for the very first time this year. And we were privileged enough, uh, for those of you that joined us a few weeks back when Scott Roberts uh, came on, David Eicher from the Astronomy Magazine is one of the board of directors and actually just after this current Starmus Festival was appointed the next president of the Starmus Board of Directors. And David Eicher has been coming on the Global Star Parties with Scott Roberts, myself and several others every week for the last year and a half now. And he had this brainchild of having not just a star party, but an upper caliber star party. And he brought Scott Roberts into it to bring 12 amazing trust, uh, trust Dobsonian telescopes out to Armenia to set up for a wonderful star party under the skies. And Scott asked for a few of us to come and join him on his outreach team. So I was privileged to be asked, so I definitely wanted to go. And so I was able to convince my college to let me leave on the third week of classes, which was a little <laughs> bit difficult to do. But we had this incredible adventure. And so I want to share a little bit of it with our Space Oddities audience. But before I do, it's not just a tough time for us in the UK and the Commonwealth countries. It's also a tough time for Armenia. And for those of you who've been following the news, just after the Starmus Festival, Azerbaijan invaded again. And so this morning, there was a statement from the Starmus board on this unprovoked uh, military action by Azerbaijan into Armenia. And anybody who's been reading some of the news stories and the horrors that have been happening there at the border, it's, it's really affecting us to know these people that we just spent so much time with, getting to know, seeing the culture, hearing their music, that now they're suffering in this way. So... Uh, it's a sad note to start with, but really there needs to be some international understanding of what's happening there at the border. When when we were invited, one of the concerns we had was that Canada had listed Armenia as a country to be wary of going to because of the conflict at the border with Azerbaijan. Now Yerevan, where we were, is far away from that border, so we felt that it was safe to travel. But just seeing that this action began right after we left was was really eye-opening. So Starmus this year, it celebrated 50 years on Mars. So there were several parts of the festival that focused on the exploration of Mars and the only planet at the moment that's kind of solely inhabited by robots. Uh, in <laughs> fact, when we got off the plane, there was a welcome right there on the tarmac, a big poster welcoming everybody to Starmus. So my daughter Tara posed in front of the poster I was, I was unfortunately really worn down from the flight, so I didn't get in the picture with her, but it was literally everywhere in the city were these posters of Starmus. And everywhere we went, people asked, well, what is this Starmus? Because they wanted to know more about it. So we were able to bring a little bit of astronomy, a little bit of outreach, a little bit of music to the entire city of Yerevan. 
So the first day there on the Sunday, we came out to an incredibly sunny, bright day. And one of the things Yerevan is known for is actually the water system. The water system is filtrated water, openly available to everyone everywhere. So even the fountains, you know, they're, they're, they're perfectly safe and they're actually incredibly great water. It's, it's slightly hard water, so it's got a nice taste to it as well. And the Republic Square, is where the largest fountain area is, we came back to it towards the end of our visit for a Dancing Fountains show. And so there's Jupiter and the Moon sharing the Dancing Fountains with us towards the end of our visit. And so we were able to come back and forth to a few of the places to see the architecture, both in the daytime as well as at night. And the city is alive. It is alive till three, past three in the morning. And some of the cafes are open 24 hours, some of the restaurants are open 24 hours, but the nightlife was bustling. This was at 11 o'clock at night that we were seeing this many people surrounding the fountains of all ages. It was really just heartwarming to see everybody getting to enjoy. And these aren't all tourists. A lot of these are just citizens who come out for this wonderful show. Yerevan itself is incredibly sunny with incredibly beautiful architecture. When we talk to the people there, they say that they have over 300 days of sun every year. Now, I'm coming from Montreal where we have over 300 days of clouds every year. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite a dichotomy to be coming there and seeing, you know, the occasional wisp of cloud and they're like, oh, it's not a great day. I'm like, this is incredible. It's amazing. The majority of the talks and the concerts that we went to were at this beautiful sports and theater complex at the top of the hill overlooking Yerevan. And you can see the steps leading up. It was a lot of steps. And uh, the very first day we got to get dropped off close to the top. But after that, with the prime minister and the president of the country coming in and out, as well as Brian May, when Brian May came, they shut off half the roads. They gave him a police <laughs> uh, escort. They, they made sure nobody else drove up. And the fact that I walked with the cane I have to deal with it. If I want to go there, I got to take the stairs or I've got to wait and get there really, really early before any of the dignitaries come or wait until the end of the event to go. There's really no way the police would let anybody through. Mm. The architecture, like I said, it was beautiful. So we posed in front of the actual entrance to the to the opera house or not the opera, house, sorry, the, the concert venue. And they had Starmus posters everywhere, as I mentioned. You know, these Starmus posters were throughout the city, throughout the venue, and it really had become kind of the conversation piece in the city. The first night was a pre-opening concert, and it was in what they called the Small Concert Hall, which is a beautiful, beautiful stage area with, with balcony seating. And it was just, I mean, this would be for a lot of cities, the concert hall. But when I show you what the concert hall is, you'll understand why this was the small one. On the plane, we had met this, we had, we had overheard an individual having a conversation in front of us about Starmus and showing pictures and stuff. So I found that really interesting, but I didn't join the conversation because there were a couple of rows ahead. When everybody got up to disembark from the plane, I kind of mentioned, you know, it was lovely hearing the Starmus talk because we're really looking forward to it. And the gentleman turned around, Max, and he's one of the official photographers for Starmus. He's from the UK. And he had just started dabbling into astrophotography. So we had a whole conversation while we were disembarking the plane. And so then often throughout the, the festival, he would come by and chat with me. And he's doing nightscape photography uh, as part of his new area of exploration. So like I said, it's, it's a congregation between science, science communication and music. So the concert started out with a talk. And the lecture talk was from Edward Moser, the Nobel Prize laureate in, uh, in in neurology, and he gave a talk on the music of the brain. And he kind of talked about the way in which the brain receives music and the way in which even bats kind of can be conditioned to create music and harmony. And then we had these wonderful performances by two jazz trios. And the jazz trio that I'm featuring here in this picture was uh, Tigran Hamalayan, Hamel Hamel who is an American-Armenian songwriter and musician and he ended up performing twice once on that day and then once the next day as part of the large uh, cosmos concert and here he was joined by a children's choir that sang back up to him during the trio performance 
As we left, we had a beautiful quarter moon uh, there. And so my wife posed with the quarter moon, but of course my daughter wanted to take a picture of it. So she grabbed her iPhone and she managed to get an incredibly clear picture with the iPhone. And I've shown you before, her iPhone photography is getting really, really good. So she was, yeah, and she was so focused. <laughs> she didn't even notice me taking a picture of her. There's Jupiter looking down on her while she takes this picture of the moon. I think Jupiter felt a little bit jealous. <laughs> the next morning, all of the speakers who were lined up to speak at this festival were also going into the schools to give talks to classes and to students. And it wasn't just at the top universities, it was even at the colleges and for a few, it was at the high schools. So Kip Thorne gave a talk at Yerevan State University along with his collaborator, Leah Halloran, and they're working on this incredible book that I mentioned last week. So Kip Thorne had written a prose book on just a little bit of trying to make gravitational curvature of space-time a little more approachable. And Leah is a painter who started painting being inspired by cosmology. And so they met at a party to celebrate Interstellar. And so they ended up chatting and she now has done a series of paintings that then inspired Kip to change his prose into poetry. Wow. So that book has now been submitted. And so in a year, this book will be published, but he gave us a brief taste of it and afterwards, he was available for conversations. So I went up to chat with him, with my daughter, Tara, because I had hosted him all the way back in 1996 at a talk at University of Guelph when I was an undergrad student there at the undergrad physics conference. He remembered the event. He didn't remember me, but he remembered the event. And then he asked to pose with my family in order to send a message to my students. And so I was able to play the start of his presentation for my students in class last week. And that was wonderful to be able to bring a message from Nobel Prize winner Kip Thorne to the class. Amazing, amazing. Wow. So then that night after we'd gone to this talk, we had the opening concert. And now this is the large concert venue in the middle of that whole complex. And you can see the sheer size of it. The the We were up in the balcony for this first night. And you can see down on the front row there just how incredibly uh full the, the stadium, but also right there towards the middle, that's Brian May. He had just arrived. And Brian May was was honored during that uh, presentation with one of the first of the Stephen Hawking Medals of Communication this year. And he was kind of taken aback by the whole offering. And then towards the end, Chris Hadfield gave a, per, gave a performance accompanied by Rick Wakeman on, keep, on uh, the piano. And so he performed Space Oddities. Now, we were up in the balcony. So this was the best I could get in terms of pictures. But David Iker and crew were all the way down at the front in this first and second row. So they got a really bird's eye view of the stage. So there's Chris Hadfield performing. And we were honored enough to chat with him later. But I'll show you those pictures in a bit. So I got a few more pictures from David Iker. This was Brian May receiving the award as introduced by Rick Wakeman. And he was really touched because he didn't feel that, that he as one of the members of the board should get this award. But if anybody's done anything in terms of science communication across both scientific genre as well as music, it's Brian May. Sure. And the video presentation they did started with a quote from Stephen Hawking talking about the award and talking about Brian May. Then we had Jane Goodall receive one of the awards and this I was able to share an excerpt of hers to my honor science students because what she talked about was how little her work was credited early on and how they tried to kind of push all of her findings aside because they went against common knowledge. So when she talked about primates having personalities and having, you know, being should be called he or she, not it. And they, they, they laughed her out. They said, no, no, none of this is actually scientific research. But when it was proven, all of a sudden, now she was getting accolades and now she was getting, you know, recognized. So she talked a little bit about the perseverance in the face of doubters when it comes to scientific work. And then we had an incredible concert by Sons of the Apollo, or Sons of Apollo, and uh, Ron Thal, uh, Bumblefoot. He gave an incredible guitar solo, going all through the crowd, sat in the laps of a few people, and then came and performed directly in front of Brian May. And this was wonderful that David Iker was able to capture these moments. 
every morning we started off with a nice breakfast at our hotel and we'd actually get together our outreach team and kind of chat. So our outreach team there on the left, you have Scott Roberts and myself. And then beside me is Gary Gable, who is from uh, uh, Texas. And in front of Scott is Norman Fulham. He is a optics maker, mirror maker from here in Montreal. And so it was wonderful. We never get a chance to hang out here in Montreal, but we went all the way to Yerevan and we got to hang out. <laughs> and then our last member was on the bottom left there. This is Ian McLennan. Ian is on the planetary uh, or the planetarium societies across the world. He's helped build planetariums everywhere, including the Montreal Planetarium. He's helped with the des redesign of the Griffiths Observatory Planetarium in their basement. And he himself is a consultant, so he's currently working with three other planetariums trying to get them up and running. He incredible man. Um, and then we also got a chance to just kind of wander the city, right? So there's so much architecture and there's there's so much joviality there throughout the city that we got to just kind of go and play and look around and go shopping and things. So there's Norma with his Stellafane t-shirt because he is a fixture at Stellafane in Vermont, which we've heard about now uh, sure. when Lou and I had gone. On the Tuesday morning, we were going to head out to go and see the place where we're doing the star party, the Temple Garni. And as we went and congregated at the hotel, Bumblefoot came downstairs and let everybody kind of check out his guitar. And there's Norman playing it for a little bit. There's Christopher Go beside him, who many people will recognize, the astrophotographer extraordinaire. And uh, he just sat and chatted with us for a little while. Then we went out to Garney, and that's the Temple Garney with the mountains in the background. It was an incredible sight. And so we went through the site, we checked the sight lines, we checked the directions, we made sure that we knew exactly what the landscape was like, where to be careful of, because there's there's a lot of history on display and you don't want to set anything up so that the crowd would disturb an area that you want to have preserved. So our team there, we all made sure that we had everything down and set for the Thursday night star party, but it only took us about an hour and a half because it was an hour drive outside of the city. And so you don't have too much time there. And there on the top left is Vivette, who's one of the student uh, leaders for the youth in, in, in Armenia, in Yerevan for astronomy outreach. That night, more talks. And so we had an incredible talk by Dr. Emmanuel Champertier, who was the uh, the, the creator, the, the discoverer of CRISPR-Cas9 technology to zip and unzip proteins. And we also had a couple of talks about ESA, uh, European Space Agency missions, uh, including one from Jean-Jacques uh, uh, Dredin himself, but uh, this one here is from uh, Chris Nally, I believe, uh, one of the incredible scientists who talked about the different Earth observation satellites that are out there that the ESA has partial uh, mission control on. There were opportunities on that first on that ground floor to interact with a lot of these speakers and there on the right side on the left, the, the gentleman who looks a little bit like Andy but smiling, uh, that's Tony <laughs> Fidel. Uh, he is one of the uh, one of the co founders at Apple of the iPod, and he was giving a talk about the hydrogen uh, uh, economy coming up uh, as we move towards greener and greener fuels. And then we had another performance, and this time what they did is they took individuals from different bands and brought them together. So we had a trio from the first night, and we had Bumblefoot from the second night come together to give a performance. And on the right there, you have Simon Phillips, who's one of the renowned drummers. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. I got a chance to chat with him a little bit later, and he's actually in Quebec City this weekend, but I can't go and visit him. But he's there for a drumming festival. Nice. So then we get to Thursday night, the the my my main event that I was aiming towards, which was at the star party. And they had actually created this beautiful entrance way that tried to mimic what it would look like if we ever were able to create some level of growth of land on Mars. And we had an almost full moon with us. And so I managed to get a nice picture of the full moon with the horizon with the mountains. We were setting up the telescopes. Like I said, we had 12 daubs brought from Explore Scientific. And so, of course, they were all still in boxes. <laughs> so we <laughs> got them all open, got them all set up, got the eyepieces to them, got the finder scopes on them and got everything arranged thanks to the help of these wonderful youth that then stepped up and said that they would run the telescopes through the night and we just come around and help to explain stuff and make sure that we debug anything when there's problems. 
And so they were led by a professor from uh, the Yerevan State University who does astronomy outreach. And they together have formed a group called Space Shop 42 to offer astro tours in Armenia. We were sent off to dinner and who do we meet at dinner but Chris Hadfield. And so he had a nice chat with my daughter and talked to her a little bit about, he had seen her four years before, five years before at an event in Montreal. And so she talked to him a little bit about what he had told her at that time. And he asked her what she's done since. And she talked about the Cosmic Generation, that international club that they've put together. And he was really happy about that and asked to have a picture taken with us. And then we had this incredible Armenian dinner, including fresh lavash being created in a, in a thunder style oven right there. And then, uh, though that stack of plate, clay plates actually all has, uh, dolmads, the, the vine leaves or grape leaves stuffed with rice and meat or rice and uh, mushrooms and we thought that that was dinner and then they started bringing out more courses but there's a star party going on outside so that we just ended up getting up and heading outside and as we got up to head outside chris hadfield had another photo opportunity with scott and ian so this was the walkway to the temple to the star party and there was a concert set up there so everything was lit up they even had this beautiful solar system garden set up so that uh, all of the dignitaries that came, all of the politicians, all of the high profile guests would get a feel for really being out in, this, out in the solar system and out under the stars. At that time, we, we found out that it was really an exclusive event up at the Temple Garni, that because it was a shuttle from the city, they made it a very exclusive event. There weren't going to be a lot of just the kids of Armenia or the public of Armenia. So Scott pulled a few of us aside and said, you know, what do we do here? Because we wanted to give the star party to the people. And so we decided that when we got back, we'd offer another star party in the city. And so we did that a little bit later. I'll show you that in a few minutes. But at the concert itself, Scott called all of us up on stage. And there on the right, you can see me in the shadows, but you see my wife and my daughter standing out really nicely under the lights. And my daughter is very proud of the fact that it's clear that she's taller than my wife in this picture. <laughs> it's yeah, absolutely clear that Karima, that. Yeah, Kar that. <laughs> Karima is now the shortest in the family. <laughs> <laughs> and then Normand got to perform Rocket Man in front of Chris Hadfield using a guitar pick given to him by Chris Hadfield. Wow. And so that was just an epic end to the night for, for the concert. That was, that was wonderful. The next day we went touring and these are the Cascade Steps. This leads up the other side of Yerevan uh, on the mountaintop facing uh, Mount Ararat. So when you go to the top, you actually see Mount Ararat out in the distance. And those of you who aren't aware, Mount Ararat is where the Noah's Ark is presumed from the stories to have actually finished its journey. So that's where the bird found land. And so a lot of the architecture and a lot of the art symbolizes Mount Ararat, but also symbolizes the main fruits of Armenia, which is the pomegranate, the apricot, and the fig. That evening we had, or that afternoon, we had a wonderful set of presentations, and I wanted to show you two of them because the top one is Paul Franklin, who did a lot of the visual arts for some of the incredible movies, First Man, Interstellar, Gravity, a few of the others. And he is based out of the UK. His visual arts studio is in the UK, and he gave a talk about trying to show real science in cinema. And that was a wonderful discussion. And I actually think maybe we should do that as a topic for Space Oddities down the road. Just Absolutely. talk about real Sounds science good. in cinema. Sounds good. And then we had a panel discussion with uh, Jean-Jacques Dedin, with uh, uh, Zhi Jing from the Chinese uh, Space Authority, and uh, Charles, um, oh, I'm trying to remember his last name. Um, I can't remember his last name, but from NASA. So they're all three former directors. And so they had a discussion about international cooperation in space exploration. And then we got to watch the premiere of the biography of Alexei Leonov, who was the first cosmonaut to do a spacewalk. And he talked about the fact that he wanted to be an artist. And so even, you know, in the early days when he was in school, he would trade his lunch his lunches because they had small lunches and they only got that's all the food they got the whole day he would trade his lunches for access to a book on art and he would take all the opportunity he could and he wanted to go to art school but he didn't have enough money for it so then he ended up 
becoming a pilot. And next thing you know, he's a cosmonaut and, you know, one of the world's most renowned ones who was training with Yuri Gagarin. And so he talked about this idea that, that they, Lenin taught them to dream. So who would deny us the right to dream about space? And it was an incredible moment to see this. And the biography came because there was a series of interviews done of him by his daughter just after his visit to Starmus a few years ago, but right before he passed away. So these are the last interviews. And so she gave context to a lot of his quotes and it was kind of interspersed between her context and his quotes and pictures and videos from his birth and his time and all of the cosmonaut explorations during the late mid sixties. My daughter was transfixed for this whole movie. I was too. It was just incredible to watch. And at the end, we realized that his daughter was actually in the audience with us the whole time, along with a bunch of the grandkids, and they were all really? watching this premiere. And so there was tears in everyone's eyes. And then afterwards, we got to meet and get pictures taken with a lot of the speakers from this past week, including uh, Bernard Scholkopf, who's one of the AI experts. Uh, he's at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, George Neild, who is with Blue Origin now, previously an astronaut with NASA. And then on the shuttle on the way back to the hotel, we ran into Garrett Reisman, who, you know, five-time NASA astronaut and now the launch controller for SpaceX. So we got to uh -huh. chat with him. And in the background, we have Eva, who is a filmmaker in Armenia, trying to bring the Armenian film industry back to life. So on our last night there, on the Saturday, just before we flew out, there was a space camp for youth. And so Scott's brainchild and what we decided to do, he and I went and set up the telescope at the Space Shop 42 tent, and we pulled it out and we shared views through a telescope to the entire public. Now they had set up an incredible area of, I think 20 tents, including a Martian booth where you could go in and get your picture taken on Mars with just a whole bunch of sand around and a bunch of mirrors so that it looks like you're completely surrounded. But Scott was inside the tent and completely a draw for the kids to come and see what a telescope is, because most of them had never seen a telescope in their life. Most people had not seen telescopes. They didn't know what they were. Wow. So then we drew the telescope outside and we just put it in the middle of the walkway and we were surrounded by people. There were talks going on on the side, talks going on in the background, but Scott, myself, and Vivek, we were surrounded by people explaining how the telescope works for the entire afternoon or evening until the sun set. And once the sun set, we started putting it on target. So we started with Saturn, then we moved to the moon, then we moved to Jupiter. And when we moved to Jupiter, uh, Mare, one of the Space Shop 42 co-founders, brought out a refractor and put that on the moon and gave a lot of people their very first view of the moon ever. This woman was completely taken aback by the fact that she could see the moon for herself and she was in tears. She spent like five minutes talking to Mara trying to figure out if that was really what she was seeing. So this whole experience of bringing the telescopes to the people was what we were hoping to do in Yerevan. That's what we were expecting. And so the next day they kept it going and they kept this, this set up sharing views through the eyepiece all the way into the night. So while we were flying in to Montreal, they were continuing and look at the throng there waiting for their views through the telescope. So I, I've got more stories to tell and uh, the Montreal, Rask Montreal Center Clubhouse this Wednesday, I'm gonna be sharing a few more Starma stories, a few videos, a few different excerpts from what I've shared tonight. So anybody's welcome to join us. It's bit.ly slash Rask Montreal, Wednesday, September 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And I will be making a Facebook event for that. But for now, for Yerevan, thank you. We had an amazing time and keep looking up. Well, thank you very much, Kareem. I mean, it just looks an amazing event. Yeah, well done. I mean, I so wish I'd been there. I would have given my eye teeth to have been there. As well, I'm sure next we year, all... we'll we'll see where Starmus is, and I'll try to let you know ahead of time, because it was well attended by just people coming from all over to just attend. It yeah. wasn't just people who were coming like myself to try to help out. Mm. There's a lot of people who just attend these Starmuses year after year after year because it's such high caliber speakers. And yeah. it's such an incredible atmosphere that it really is worth it to go. 
absolutely. Well, viewers, if you have any questions for Kareem about Star Wars, do put them in the chat, and I'm sure he'll uh, he'll do his best to answer them. Uh, Steve. Oh, Steve, yeah. I was just going to ask Kareem. I mean, the, the talks, the whole event sounds fantastic. The talks particularly sound really interesting. Do they at any point become publicly available? So we're not sure. They were recorded, and a few of the events were shared live on Armenian TV. I know that because our, our hotel person actually told us that she saw the concert and she thinks she saw us on the on the audience. So that was that was really nice on the second night. Um, it, you know, it was it was kind of spectacular for us to have a vantage at all. And then on the Tuesday when we were at Garney doing the walkthrough. Scott was like, why are you sitting up in the balcony? You're part of the helpers. You should be down here. And I'm like, well, we don't have the tag because we're not speakers. He said, no, no, just go and tell them that you're part of it. Here's a photo to show them that you're here at Garney. And uh, for the rest of the event, we were down on the main floor. So that was incredible. So we saw the videotaping happening. And we asked David Eicher, and he said that Garrick knows whether or not they'll ever be made public, but he will check with them. I do know that they will be selling videos of previous Starmus concerts. Um, that's something that they do on occasion to try to raise money for specific types of uh, endeavors, including for host countries at times when they end up having a deficit for the program. Um, but I don't know for sure if any of the talks will be. Uh, One of the neat things that I'll add in is the talks that the Nobel Prize winners and these incredible luminaries gave at the concert hall were about 15 to 20 minutes in length. The talks that they gave at the schools were an hour in length. So they really went into more detail, more context, more base knowledge to make sure that the students really understood why this was important work that they were doing. And that was a complete, I, I, I just, I mean, it blew my mind as, as a teacher that they would go out and some of the some of the Nobel Prize winners would travel for over an hour to a school first thing in the morning to go and give a one hour talk and come back and then be there in the evening for the for the for, for the performances. One Amazing. more quick thing. Do you know do you know the title of the Kip Thorne Poetry and Art book? I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, keep an eye out for that. And apparently he also is in the middle of a collaboration on another movie. So there's a new movie currently being uh, being developed or already filmed. I'm not sure, but he said to keep an eye out for that uh, sometime in the next few years. Brilliant, Thanks, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Anad, Kareem. yeah, Karim, I have two two things. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that your daughter is extremely lucky to be able to be exposed to you know the enthusiasm the passion but also to be able to get to meet these people yeah. it's just it's just wonderful like you're that's just it just blew my mind i'm so jealous so we were chatting about this a bit at the start and andy was asking you know how did she re and i i i don't know if she'll listen to this later or if she's going to wait for wednesday but you know she she was she she's 14 so she felt a little bit intimidated and she was definitely the youngest person in most of the groups and most of the audiences but at any point, if there was a chance for her to interact or if anybody talked to her, she was herself. Like she bloomed and she she ended up joking around with Bumblefoot. And she just ended up like, you know, he, he said something, she teased back, he made a joke about me and she made a funnier joke about me. And <laughs> and so, you know, like she 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 knew that these were luminaries. And we had this discussion a few times. So during during one of the talks, she turned to me and asked me to explain a few things to her and ended up every now and then shushing me because she wanted to make sure she didn't miss anything and then came back and said okay continue <laughs> right so she was taking charge of her own learning uh, from that experience and i loved that i, I think um my daughter who's nearly 12 uh, she would have adored it as well yeah. and oh then my daughter's uh, you know she's going through that difficult phase where she's really really shy and won't talk to anybody um but uh, she would have enjoyed it she really would have enjoyed it. so hopefully you know, next year's Starmus, uh, I can take her. Uh, That'd be wonderful. Far away. The yeah. two young ladies can move around together. That would be great. And, oh, she'd love that. She'd love that. And yeah. and on that last day for the star party, when we were still like in that crowd and talking to this to to people, but the sun hadn't set yet, my wife saw that the opera was starting because it was in front of the opera house. Well, so I... she got tickets and took my daughter to a one-hour opera, oh, and fantastic. then came back out to join the star party after. So 
because my daughter had been staring at the opera house going, I want to see what it looks like inside. You know, can we go to a performance? Do we have time? And so my wife made it happen. Oh, wow. They even took a walking tour while we were at Garney. So, you know, did, they did got to see the, the history opera? of the city. <laughs> She, she loved the opera. Oh, she did. Good, she did. good, good, good. Bernard? Yeah, I have one, one last thing is, uh, so Starmus initially started in the in La Palmas in the Canaries Islands. Yes. And they did the first three sessions, three festivals. And then afterwards, they started to move out, I think in Switzerland, Norway, and now exactly. in Armenia. Do you know where the next one is going to take place? Have they talked about it? So I heard a buzz that it might be back at the Canary Islands because they haven't been there in a bit. And then start to move off again into other other places because that was the home right that was where mm. it started out and especially i i think uh i think tenerife was was where they're looking at this time around otherwise but um they'll they'll probably announce it at some point but the part of the part of the thing was was garrick is stepping back a little bit and so david eicher was voted in as the new president and so there's going to be a whole strategy for communication and for these decision making because they want to now have a long term vision. Because during COVID, they weren't able to run it and they weren't sure if they wouldn't be able to fulfill their promise to Armenia to go there. Mm. And now that they were able to do it, I think now they've got that momentum to keep building. Cool. Sure. Cool. Sure. Uh, and how is that? How is Starmus funding? Where, where does the money come from? Just out of interest. Uh, most of so. This was this was a chat that that we kind of had because I don't think any of these dignitaries, luminaries, Nobel Prize winners actually charge. I think maybe their flight is covered and their hotel is covered, but I don't think they charge their speaker fees because this is a group of peers kind of hanging out together for a week. Sure. Right. So one of the ones we didn't get to go to was Charlie Duke's presentation, and that's because they moved it to a different time, and so we missed it. And so we missed Charlie Dukes because it was the morning after the star party. We didn't get back from the star party till close to 5 a.m. because we were the last ones wrapping up with Scott. I saw pictures of Charlie Duke and, and uh, Dottie, his wife, having dinner with Brian May that night and just, you know, sitting back and chatting relaxed. And those those types of pictures were, were circulating throughout the event as these guys oh. were just they were getting a chance to be together. Sure. And when you have a chance with kindred spirits, it's, you know, it, it's something you want to do. So it doesn't, it's not an official engagement in terms of you're getting paid to go there. I think, I don't know for sure, but I think it's a chance to be among kindred spirits. Yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah. that's the closest. Fantastic. Well, thank you very thank much you. again for that, Kareem. And uh, my pleasure, yeah, lovely set yeah, of thank flies you. there. You took some yeah. wonderful photos, and uh, I think it's you. Uh, looks a lady, uh, very, very keen to go to the next one. And so, uh, so we'd love to have you. Uh, yeah. right, yes, I'd love to be there. I'd love to be there, and I think my daughter will have grown up a bit since then. And uh, you know, she, she might have, uh, you know, she might agree to go with me if I bribe her. So, anyway, right then, moving on. <clears throat> um, so I think the next thing we'll do is to come to Roger. Uh, Roger, you've got a couple of things tonight. Apart from your normal night sky slot, uh, you want to tell us about an, a, a little more about the DART mission, which uh, comes to fruition a week uh, today, isn't it? Next Monday mm. or next Tuesday, because it's just after midnight. But anyway, tell, tell us about it. OK, well, first of all, I should do my presentation with some interesting images from the last week from the James Webb Space Telescope. So Excellent. we shall do that. Let's see what moment. the web has been up to. Okay. Okay, so here we are for the week 19th to the 25th of September, and the moon is coming up to uh, a new moon on next Sunday. So, uh, Hooray. if there's any, yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I know that, you don't like that. it. I know you okay. don't like it, but, uh, but there we are. Roger, images image I, images oh. I've taken during uh, last night and the night before of, of the moon, Mars, which is gradually getting closer to us and uh, will be a lot more uh, interesting to look at, but uh, grab what I can. And uh, Jupiter and Io. Jupiter and Io. That's unfortunate. Um, I don't get to see the red spot very often, so... It, it, it's looking a bit bland when I imaged it last night. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another picture of uh, 
of Saturn. And as you can see, now we're getting past uh, the opposition. We're now starting to see a shadow cast across part of the rim, rings now. So, uh, Roger, could I just ask you to go back to your Jupiter and Io image? Yes. Um, just, just out of interest, uh, firstly, you've, you've caught the colour of Io really well there. Mm. Um, and um, just for any viewers who don't know, that little moon of Jupiter is uh, the, the most mm. actively volcanic world in the solar system. In fact, it was the first place in the solar system that volcanoes were found beyond the Earth. And at any given time, it has more than 200 erupting volcanoes. So the whole moon is just one basically yeah. giant volcano. And the heat from that comes from constantly being stretched and squeezed by Jupiter's massive gravity, which causes uh, rampant volcanism. Thank you, I just wanted to, to drop That's that. That's right. Away. And as you can see on that slide, we've got the opposition of Saturn on the 26th, so during next week, just as a matter of interest. But Jupiter, it does yeah. remain quite close and large to uh, look at and image through, uh, through the rest of the year. So uh, it's not going to diminish in size very much at all over the next few months. So. Uh, well worth having a look at if you are able to. Well, well in fact, uh, next Monday, Jupiter will be at its closest to the Earth in the last 70 years. So that will be an event to go and look at. Go, go out and look at Jupiter. You, you can't miss it in the eastern sky. It's the brightest thing there. And in, mm. e even in binoculars, you will see the, the, the uh, well, up to four moons of Jupiter. And in, even in a small telescope, it's just, just fantastic. Mm. OK, sorry, Roger, carry on. That's all right. So, um, during midnight of this week, we, we still got Saturn, Jupiter and Mars uh, up in the night sky. Jupiter does get up quite high and uh, does look quite uh, awesome without the uh, moon in the way. Mm. And uh, Mars is now passing, uh, passed through Pleiades and is still in Taurus. So, uh, it will get up quite uh, high during, during the evening and uh, is also worth looking at. And as we can see, um, Poro Saturn is gradually waning over to the Western horizon. And yeah. also, if anyone should be in the Southern Hemisphere watching this programme, we've got uh, the same uh, three planets on view, but at a vastly higher latitude in the sky. So. Uh, they're uh, rather more fortunate to get clearer views of those planets as well. But this week, uh, over the last week, we've got some images of Mars from the James Webb, which has got uh, some interesting images taking in the near cam um, system and uh, just gives you a comparison of what there is on view to a normal uh, visual view from the uh, of the planet's surface. The Quite difference amazing. in the basin is incredible. Isn't yes. it? Mm. Isn't it? Absolutely. Even the crater, when you focus in on that subsolar point, you can yeah. see the crater. It okay. actually does pop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and just, just to remind uh, viewers, what we're looking at are infrared images. So this is basically heat radiating mm -hmm. away from Mars that we're we're looking at, and obviously uh, different colors represent uh, different amounts of heat. Um, but the, these are marvelous infrared images. Mm. And the, the, the contrast in them is quite marked, isn't it? It's surprisingly yeah. so. Mm. But you've obviously got uh, areas of Mars that are radiating a lot more heat than others. So yes. yeah, because of their composition. So that's, that's lovely. And uh, here is a sort of a composition of what is in the atmosphere. Yes, I don't suppose it's anything different than what we already know from uh, from the Martian landers that have already been sampling the atmosphere. So uh, I don't think there's anything ab abnormal spotted from, from uh, the James Webb on, on that aspect anyway. But it does give you a, a nice visual idea of the relative uh, parts, doesn't it, of, of mm -hmm. the carbon dioxide and the, the carbon monoxide. So that's mm -hmm. that's really nice. Yes. But uh, no methane, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Anyway, no, no methane. we've also got the Orion Nebula, which has been observed yeah, as well different. with some interesting colours and uh, visual comparisons. Here we've got uh, one from the Spitzer and the James Webb showing the 
immense yeah. resolution and clarity of the same uh, areas that we do have in an, a similar um, part of the spectrum there. And, and just to just to quantify that, the the James Webb Space Telescope has 18 times the resolution of Spitzer. And, mm. you know, this is a perfect demonstration of that. Absolutely. Mm. And uh, here we are with some highlights of, of, an, of an area there to uh, highlight some of the different uh, items that are is, is yeah. in that yeah. area itself. Because as you can see in the top left, you've got a young star that's still in its... Um, I think they're called block globulars. Aren't Buck they? Globules. Buck, Buck, Buck globules. Sorry, Buck, mm. Buck globules. So it's still in its cocoon of gas. Um, it's slowly puffing it away. Um, then in the centre, you've got uh, or Orionis A, uh, the very bright star. Then you've got moving over to the right hand side at the bottom, you can see all the filamentation. But the one that really strikes me is the one on the top uh, right which is a young star, and you can see it's popped off most of its cocoon, but you can still see the cocoon around it. But if you look closely at that star, it's actually got a disk around it. Yeah, sure. And that is actually a solar system in the making. They will go on to uh, make planets. Um, and so, uh, as I said, that's a solar system. In and, the and our own solar system may well have looked exactly like that in its infancy. Yeah. So One of the amazing things is most of the ones that we've seen where the solar systems are forming, we see face on. That's how we can yes. know it. But mm, this one right. is at an angle it's where an we're angle, seeing yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's looks incredible. Like, it looks like a big mushroom. It's fantastic. Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. 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 And just some other images also yeah. collected in that area. As a Hubble as well. Well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. That's right. Can you just go back one? Yes. Um, if you look sort of towards the top right, there are stars there that Hubble didn't see at all because they were hidden yeah. behind dust. Yeah. Lots of stars that, that only the James Webb can see because um, uh, James Webb being an infrared telescope can see through all that dust. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. Yeah, and you can Absolutely. see extra formation in the filaments as well. And you, you can yeah. see already that James Webb is, is rewriting the uh, the astronomy textbooks, isn't it? I mean, it's mm. just, it's amazing. Yeah. It's a truly amazing instrument. Right. Great. Yes. Amazing details. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. Thank you, look Roger. At that. Yeah. Right. But I've also got. Uh, Regarding the uh, dart, yeah. We, uh, right. Let's just share that. This is a this is the uh, website from Dart, and it's also got a live countdown of the event for the impact, which is just a week and three and a half hours away. So uh, that would be quite an interesting uh, thing to uh, to see. So uh, and because. Because the asteroid is only 13 light seconds from the Earth, uh, we will get to know what happened in, um, in, 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 you know, in, in a very brief mm. amount of time. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think we better explain exactly what the DART mission Definitely. is. Um, it's a mission, and it's um, the re DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Mm. And what they're going to do is two little um, probes um one's a little cubesat which will be taking photographs and images and analysis of what actually happens and the larger part will actually crash into the small moon um the uh, the asteroid is called uh didymos um which means twin in greek and it it was found to because it was found to have, be in this binary system um, the smaller moon, which originally was called Didymos, uh, Didymos B, then it was called Diddy Moon, it's sort of like the Diddy, the Doddy Men. Um, <laughs> and then about eventually it was given Diam the name Diamorphus. It's one of the smallest objects, asteroids, uh, or planetesimals, or whatever you want to call it, um, to actually be given a designated name. Um, and Diamorphus again is Greek and it means. Um, existing in two states, and it's a that's a point towards where the fact that once it's hit, um, they're hoping to see if they can actually deflect it um, and move it in any sort of uh, meaningful way. 
And the whole idea behind this is for the protection of Earth from um, near Earth asteroids. Mm. Um, and it's one of the ways they're looking at maybe can we actually deflect an item or move it mm -hmm. in, um, in its uh, orbit in any way. Um, but that's what it's all about. And uh, hopefully next week, um, with it actually happening on the Monday, as we said, unfortunately, it's happening early Tuesday morning. Um, uh, so we won't be doing a live event, but we'll have a special. Um, we'll just talk about things near Earth asteroids and the DART mission and uh, other things associated with it. So uh, there's right. something to look forward to. It'll be just a little uh, yeah. uh, something altogether it's an exciting it's an exciting impact it's the yeah. whole the whole plan for this specific mission was really well thought out and so they plan on actually visiting by and seeing it a few years later as well to make sure that everything evolves the way in which we expect mm. yeah yeah, yeah it was, it was part so, of a couple of um projects that they were thinking about and another one i think was called deep is called deep impact and that's to um to later this uh this that's the movie decade and that. that's yeah, the movie, movie yeah. but uh, they've also <laughs> actually got a, 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 a same sort of issue going on well uh, this is not the first time that they've done it of course um because uh, years ago uh, they did a similar impact uh test um so uh, this is not something that the stranger to but I, know, I do have to ask the the mission was launched last year has anybody seen bruce willis since no, no. Oh, interesting. No, he's, he's, interesting. He's, yeah, so he's, he's on his way there. there yeah. yeah. But it does it does raise the whole question of if there were a, 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 an asteroid that were threatening the Earth with an impact, what the hell would we do? What are the options? What could we do? Mm. And, um, you know, let's hope the movie Don't Look Up doesn't come true uh, yeah. because <laughs> I have a horrible feeling it would. But there are practical things that we might do, a range of yeah. options. So uh, we want to put together a bit of a special about that to tell you all about the, the risk from asteroids and, and yeah. what we might do. So and tell you about yeah. some of the protocols that um, especially the USA have come up with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll, we'll put that together and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get that. I think up. Bernard wanted to say something, didn't you? No, actually, yeah. No, okay, no, yes. okay, well, moving on. Uh, I'm afraid there'll be no viewers gallery this week because uh, Rachel is otherwise engaged. Uh, actually, she's married because it's her husband's birthday today. And, hey, uh, happy birthday, so, Johnny. Happy birthday, Johnny. Uh, if you're looking in, have a fantastic day. And will you both have a fantastic day. And uh, hopefully Rachel will be back next week. So, uh, you know, please keep your sending your, your pictures in because we will show them. We never miss any that you send in. Um, but unfortunately, we can't do so today. So that's something to look forward to next week. Bernard, tell us about this uh, this uh, NASA person. Yeah, yeah. Know. I just I just wanted to quickly mention uh, for those that uh, you know like us are passionate about science and especially planetary science, who've been following you know uh, mission selections and mission launches and and all the rest. There's always a name that comes out, and that's the name of Thomas Zuberkin. Uh, Thomas Zuberkin is the uh, associate administrator. Uh, at NASA uh, for science. Basically, he's this head of science at NASA, and he's been incredibly influential in the last six, seven years uh, being in that position. And he's he's been instrumental in the selection process of uh, of discovery missions at NASA uh, and, and, and other types of missions. And um, so he's from uh, Switzerland, Switzerland born. And then uh, he he did uh, his studies in uh, in the University of Bern, if I recall well, as a physics. And then he moved to the U.S. And then he he slowly climbed the ladder there and and was very quickly recognized as a as a as, you know as someone of great potential. And um, and after all these years at NASA, he's just announced last week that he's stepping down. That uh, right. not not the thing of you know. Um, not that anything bad happened. He just uh, he just thought that he 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 did what he had to do, and now he just wants to leave the place for someone else. And uh, and uh, I just wanted to mention it out there because it's someone that you probably have been seeing a lot. And uh, so he'll yeah. be stepping down at the end of the year. And uh, let's see who comes next. Uh, well, thank, but yeah, thank you very much for that. We wish him all the best for the future, obviously. Yeah, course, and yeah. uh, and there we are. Well, um, just a, a little bit of space news uh, from this evening. SpaceX this evening completed a, a seven engine spin prime test of their uh, booster seven uh, in preparation for their first orbital flight attempt. 
and followed about 45 minutes later by a seven engine static fire test of, of Booster 7. Both tests seem to go very well, and Elon Musk has already tweeted that both tests seem to go very well indeed. So SpaceX are edging ever closer towards their first orbital flight test of the Booster B7, the Falcon Super Heavy B7 with Starship on the top of it. And, um, and I would think that they would be doing it before Christmas. I think um, sometime towards Christmas would be a, a valid estimate for that because they've still got a lot of testing to do. So there we are, that's, uh, that's news from SpaceX. And that just about uh, wraps up things for tonight. Steve, can we hold your, your photo thing over till next week? Is that all right? You can hold it until any time it suits. That's fine. Right. Well, we'll, we'll definitely put you down for next week. So get it ready for next okay. week. And, sure. yeah, uh, and I'll also do my bit about um, Frank. Yes, Drake. we also want to tell you uh, about the sad uh, passing of uh, Frank Drake, yeah. who you may know from the Drake Equation, and we'll uh, dazzle, we'll get onto that next week. We'd like to thank you very much for, for watching us tonight, as always. And uh, you could do us a favor by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification bell because it all helps us. We will be back next Monday again with uh, some more uh, fantastic tales from, from the universe. And until then, have a fantastic week. And uh, we wish you all the best. And thank you so much for being here tonight, especially today. So keep looking up. Yeah, keep looking up. And uh, it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from the panel. Bye. Bye. Everybody take bye. care. <laughs> we'll see you all uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye bye. <laughs>